It was one of those things where they would always say, well, super, on Earth, Superman's hair doesn't grow the way it would normally, so he doesn't get a beard, he doesn't get long hair. And then twice a year they would do Superman on a desert island where he's got long hair and a, <laughs> and a beard. And I would go, what? I, 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 I. You know, and it was, it was kind of the same stuff when I was a kid. I used to say, when was he so stupid that he told people he had a secret identity? So you jump over to, to DC yeah. to do this. You mentioned that your first exposure to the character was through the Superman TV show. With George Reeves. So for you, growing up in England, the, the Superman was created in the 50s on television. You betcha, in black and white. <laughs> how did that impact your approach to the character and what you did? Because you, you really took that character and turned him inside out. Well, I've always said that my Superman was built out of every single Superman I'd ever seen. So there was some George Reeves, there was some Christopher Reeve, there was some of the Fleischer animation, just everything all mashed together. And then some of the, the ideas that had been festering in my brain for, uh, oh, how long was it? I was six when I saw my first Superman comic. So. After you turned in your proposal for the, for the series, when did you start getting pushed back from DC and all the changes you were bringing to the Superman mythos? Because there were a lot. There, well, there was no real pushback because I told them about it in advance. But I did come to think eventually that what they really wanted was some superstar, and in this case me, to come in and take over Superman and make it hugely popular again without actually doing anything. But I had told them about every single thing. That's my list of unreasonable demands that I gave them. Uh, so they, they didn't push back very hard. In fact, the only thing, there was only one thing they wanted changed. And uh, I, had, I had sat there and I said, okay, kryptonite can kill Superman. How do we know that? How do we know that kryptonite can kill Superman? So I came up with the idea that it was the pregnant Lara who was sent to Earth. She gives birth to Kal-El on Earth and then she's exposed to kryptonite and dies. And that's how we know. And Jeanette, Jeanette Kahn, thought that was a, maybe a little too radical. And she suggested that what if the core of Krypton was already turning into kryptonite? So even before he leaves, people are dying. And I said, well, that's brilliant. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. I'll take credit for that. Um, so that, that was, was the only major that was pushback the you only had. thing they pushed back on. They didn't mind me making Ma and Pa Kent younger. Uh, they didn't mind me, well, putting him back at the Daily Planet, which I think he sort of had been already. They didn't mind the fact that you didn't have a big action scene, I th I'm trying to think, until like issue three or four of Man of Steel? It was pretty low key, yeah, since, well, that was an odd thing too, because- Compelling story, but it was very modern thinking in terms, if you look yeah. at stories now, the cynical readers out there will say, oh, it was written for the trade. No, but it was, you were really telling a story, but there wasn't a slugfest. I think until issue three or four. I don't think there were trades in those days. There weren't. You know, um, and the weird thing is that Dick Giordano had said to me at one point, his one contribution, he said, you know, show us the different design of Krypton on the first page of the first issue. So everybody knows it's different. So I did that. And then about uh, halfway into my actual run, I kind of went, you know, I really should have started with the shot of Clark playing football to show people that things are different and then have him find out about Krypton the same time the readers do, you know? Because in the original run, way back in, you know, the, the before time, he didn't find out about Krypton until like 10 years in. So I, I really wish I'd kind of gone that way. Your portrayal of Krypton was controversial back then because you really changed the, the identity of the planet yeah. for the readers. What was the purpose of that? To me, it seemed like you were trying to really emphasize uh, how much Earth and the Kents had an impact on making Superman who he was. Well, exactly right. I mean, he says that at the end of the first issue, it's Earth that made me human. Um, the original design for Krypton by Joe Schuster was very much influenced by Flash Gordon, which is fine. That was 19, well, 34 when he did it, 38 when it was published. 
and it stuck. So in 1972, 1976, it still looks like 1934 Flash Gordon. So the first thing I said was, well, I gotta blow this up. I've gotta completely redesign Krypton. And I basically, I put on my Sid Mead hat and, and started just doodling stuff and came up with um, my mile high tower desert planet things. Yeah, to me, when I hear some of the complaints, people <laughs> that have gone back and seen the run, they say, well, it takes away the fact that he's this immigrant. I go, not really. He still, no. he still embraces, he still talks about being an alien and it comes up in the story in, in the limited series right away. But that, to me, that's always been an aspect of the reboot that you did that, that I think has kind of been misread. Well, you know, I'm an immigrant, so I understand what that's all about, you know, to have been born in one place and to grow up in another. You've been a citizen in three countries, haven't you? I have, England, Canada, and now I'm an American, damn it. And uh, so I get the sense that you go somewhere else. In fact, I said this about Superman. He, he went somewhere else and became there something he could never have been if he'd stayed on Krypton. Of course, if he'd stayed on Krypton, he would have been dead. But assuming Krypton didn't blow up, he would never have become, unless Mort Weisinger was the editor, he would never have become Superman. As someone who's an admitted fan of the Silver Age, I mean, you were a big comics fan before you got into the business. You, you went to great pains to explain away a lot of the silly things that the Silver Age Superman comics never even bothered to explain. No more crypto. No yeah. more super whoever. Let me correct you. I didn't explain them. I just didn't use them. <laughs> you did, but, but you explained certain things that were never discussed. Yeah. The shaving. The shaving. It may be the most controversial element Could of be. your whole Superman Could run. Be. Superman shaving. You, I'd forgotten that, that I read somewhere that that was something that bugged a lot of people. And then I went and I saw it, and, and I remember the shaving scene. And the part that really entertained me was the piece of the rocket ship. Yep. But that makes sense because then you would have raised another question because the heat vision would have burned through anything else. Through anything else. <laughs> yeah. And Why did that bother you? The, the, well, it was one of those things where they would always say, well, super, on Earth, Superman's hair doesn't grow the way it would normally. So he doesn't get a beard. He doesn't get long hair. And then twice a year, they would do Superman on a desert island where he's got long hair and a, <laughs> and a beard. And I would go, what? I didn't that. You know, and it was, it was kind of the same stuff when I was a kid. I used to say, when was he so stupid that he told people he had a secret identity? Why would he do that? He's walking around with his face hanging out. This isn't like Batman wearing a mask and people are gonna go, somebody's under there. This is what Superman looks like all the time, right? And of course you can tell that when I take my glasses off, I don't look anything like me. Obviously. Reminds me of the Lois and Clark scene. I'm Sue. Oh, I'm yeah. Clark Kent. I'm Superman. <laughs> well, that's, you mean in the first movie? No, in, in the TV show, they, they made oh. a point of making a joke okay. of, of that. Oh, the glasses, yeah, it looks totally different. Because there's, there's an amazing scene in the first Christopher Reeve movie where Lois has gone into the bedroom to change and Clark is standing there and he realizes he's got to tell her and he, he takes off his glasses and he stands up. And then he stands up like another four inches. <laughs> and then he puts his glasses back on before she comes in. But uh, Christopher Reeve convinced me that you can part your hair on the other side and wear a pair of glasses and slouch and look like somebody else. He really did. Clark Kent really came into his own as a character, in my eyes, as a comic book fan during this run because he became more than just, you know, that costume. Yeah. And that you make Clark Kent the main character, Superman, was his costumed identity. Superman was his fortress of solitude. And I, think, and, and I love the fact that he played football because if, you're, if anybody has those kind of powers at that age, if we're thinking, you know, rationally, everyone's going to use it yeah. and try to become the football star because who, who doesn't want to be popular? Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting. And then, then you built the Pa Kent life lesson around that. Yeah. That, that basically came from two sources. Um, the George Reeves, Clark Kent, who was a no-nonsense kind of guy. He wasn't the wimpy, oh, Clark, there's a monster attacking. Oh, get out of my office, Lois. You know, and off he goes. <laughs> and also it came from the way they used to play Dick Grayson, which the Dick in school was always like the second best guy on the, on the hockey team, the second best guy on the football team. They didn't try to hide. He wasn't wimpy. He wasn't wearing glasses or anything. He was almost as good as Robin. 
And so people can look and go, well, he's almost as good as Robin, but he's not as good as Robin. You know, and it was the same thing with, with, with Clark. He doesn't have to be a total win. You depowered the character. What was the reasoning behind it? Because the Superman that, that, that existed up at that point could, I think, move planets. It was inspired by Denny O'Neill, who once said unto me, uh, it's really hard to write interesting stories for a character who can destroy entire alien races by listening hard. And I said, you know, yeah. I mean, I saw the first Superman movie 112 times. I mean, that is actually the number of times I saw it. <laughs> and I noticed that the civilian audience, you know, they're going, oh, look, he's flying. Oh, look, he's knocking the dam over. But the moment they cheered, the whole audience cheered every time I saw it, was when he ripped off the car door to get to Lois. And I said, because that's relatable. That's something nobody has ever wanted to push over a dam, right? But everybody's wanted to tear a car door off. Save somebody. Save yeah. somebody. And I said, that's, that's what we need to think about, that he's, yeah, he's Superman, but he's not inconceivable. You know, we can, we can relate to what he does. Yeah, he's still incredibly powerful. Yeah. The reinvention of, of a lot of the characters in the Superman supporting cast were really interesting. To me, the, 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 the most fascinating one was Lex Luthor, mm. which, you know, Lex Luthor, mad scientist, was the bane of his existence for right. decades. And then all of a sudden he became Gordon Gecko on steroids. Right. Well, that was Marv <laughs> Wolfman's idea. You know. Marv had been offered the, the, the second seat. And he called me up one day and said, well, before I accept this, I want to tell you my, what my plans were for Luther. And he told me this, and I said, I love it. You know, I mean, there's only one thing I don't like. And he said, okay, we don't have to do that. And I said, okay, you know, I love it. It's, it's great. We turned him into, what was that guy's name? He was big in the Trump something? Yeah. You know. <laughs> Whatever happened to him? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but what was interesting to me reading that is that it made absolute sense why he hated Superman. Mm -hmm. This is a rich guy who, who owned everything. His ship. It was a cruise ship. It wasn't a yacht. It was, yeah. a, it was literally a cruise ship. And what he hated about Superman was so basic and so primal, just jealousy. He yeah. was jealous that he had something that he couldn't have no matter how much money he threw at it. It's one, it's one little step beyond that. That's the basic. Uh, somebody had suggested that I should read the, the play Amadeus because the relationship between Mozart and Salieri is Superman and Luther. So I read it and I said, no, it's not because Salieri acknowledges that Mozart is greater than he is. Luther would never do that. So Luther is insanely jealous of Superman but it's more on the level of he thinks everybody else on Earth is stupid because they don't realize that he's better than Superman. Lois Lane is so uh, strong-willed and, and, and so, uh, you know, bullheaded in this. She is the classic bulldog reporter in, in this. I imagine Lois was a lot of fun to, to write. Lois was a lot of fun because I like strong women and very revealing because I got a lot of negative mail about my interpretation of Lois. Oh, she's too butch. Oh, she's too tough. Oh, you know, she isn't feminine enough. And then I did the issue where the toy man, was it the toy man? Yeah, captured her and tied her up. And it went 180 degrees with that issue. Oh, Lois is so great. Lois is so cool. Uh, oh, dear God, all I had to do was tie her up. It, it was great to see the relationship and the competition, especially early on, between Clark and Lois as reporters. And again, I, I've always been a fan of comics that give the civilian life uh, its due. It was nice to see the Daily Planet become a, a big player in that, just not something to break up the panels. Yeah, well there I was pulling heavily from all the President's Men, of course, with all the dynamics that you see in there. and. Uh... And also introduced the fact that Lois and Clark are both novelists on the side. And she had won an Edgar Allan Poe Award. Um, what was her, her novel, Shadows on the Grass, I think I called it. But uh, yeah, I wanted to expand everybody. Tell me about drawing Superman because, oh, by the way, besides plotting and writing all the stories, you were also penciling all these issues. You were I'm doing two official. books a month? 
Two, yeah. Two months. And ultimately, drawing two and writing three. Yeah. So, tell me about coming up with your look for the character. Little, slight little tweaks. A little bit. There. What was the challenge? The shield? The biggest challenge was that Kurt Swan's version was so in my brain that it was like a likeness. It was like a photograph. And I suck at likenesses. I'm really bad at likenesses. And I said, you know, there's no way I'm going to be able to draw Kurt's Superman in my style. So I'm going to have to come up with my Superman. And I did. And I must have gone through at least half a sketchbook with little tiny heads. You know, just one, one, a little narrower, longer, you know, this, that, the other thing. And the biggest change I made was, of course, I got rid of the spit curl and turned it into just a fallen lock of hair. Because I said, I don't think anybody outside of punk rockers do spit curls anymore. You know, come on. Very important change. <laughs> Ultimately, um, although I don't think it was as, as big a change subtly as when the spit curl went from curling one way to curling the other long before I got there, when they literally turned it into an S. You know. <laughs> subtle. Yeah, <laughs> subtle, never subtle. But you mentioned the, the shield, the chest emblem. The only thing I really did was that was make it bigger. Because I said, you, know, you always had this kind of like this here. And I said, no, let's, let's, let's go shoulder to shoulder here. And then I just used uh, my old trick of, of drawing two fish swimming past each other to make the S. Because so. I first saw the S when I couldn't really read yet. And I still remember the day running into the kitchen with my Superman calling, Mommy, Mommy, it's an S. <laughs> Favorite uh, storyline from your run? Do you have one? Yes. Um, and it's incredibly tiny. It's only nine pages long. But it's the Luthor and the waitress. You remember that one? Yeah, yeah. That is my favorite story. Why? I don't know. I think it's because, well, it was a Superman story, but Superman wasn't in it. I always liked doing that kind of stuff. And of course, it explored Luther in a big way. And uh, I had a sequel in mind that I never got to do, which is unfortunate. But, uh, Why? Because you left the book? Because I left the book. You know, DC is still around. I know. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is, if you like. I'd love to hear it. Luther gets on the elevator at the top of whatnot. And there's the waitress, and she's got a shotgun. And she just, you know, holds him there and keeps him there, and Superman detects what's going on, and he comes, and, and, and she's, Superman, save me. This woman is going to kill me. And why are you doing this? And she tells him the story. And Superman goes, OK, cool, and flies away. <laughs> And so she levels the, the gun at Luther and pulls the trigger, and it goes bang. Little bang sign comes up. And that's her revenge. You scare the life out of Luther. You scare the life out of it. Yeah. You, should, you should have called him about that. You absolutely should have called him. Somebody else did a sequel, and of course had her with a real gun. Any second thoughts? Anything that you would do differently with the gift, given uh, the gift of hindsight? Well. What I usually say is, if I could go back in time and whisper in my ear, when Dick called and said, put your money where your mouth is, I would say, no. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do the whole thing. Why not? It should have been one of the most pleasant experiences of my whole life, but it turned out to be just an endless, endless pain. Partly editorial, partly other writers, partly the, the powers that were. just. It was the death of a thousand cuts. And finally I said, OK, I'm leaving. And uh, I look back now and say, I wish I hadn't done it.